you are one uh, uh, justice at the Texas Supreme Court, and I just was wondering if you could share a little bit with our audience. How long have you been on the Texas Supreme Court? I've been here seven years. Seven uh, years. This past November, November the fourth is when Governor Perry appointed me, and I was appointed to fill a vacancy, and then I had to run for re-election in 2006. 2006, I went. I ran statewide, and of course won. Now I'm up for re-election, and we have a primary that was originally scheduled in March, as you know, which has been moved to April the 3rd. So okay. I have a, an election, and I'm going to work hard and try to uh, do something that no other Latino Republican has done, and that's win re-election on a statewide basis. And that's a challenge that I have. It's a challenge that I, I embrace. You know, and I can hear vo the voice right now of Jose Peña. you got to get out there. you got to work hard. Yes. You, can, you can do it. Uh, you know, it was through his help, I became the first Republican uh, judge elected countywide in Harris County. And so that's all part of Joe's legacy. Not, not only with me, but I think every Latino Republican, certainly in, in Harris County, and, and I think throughout the state, have a great debt uh, to Joe Pena. Now I understand that you are the fourth Hispanic that have ever been in the Supreme Court of Texas. Can you tell me a little bit about that and which Hispanics were before you and then you and which Hispanics have been after you? Absolutely. The, uh, our first uh, Latino elected statewide was my friend Raul Gonzalez, who I had the honor of meeting when I was in law school. He made a big impression on me and of course, you know, I was a Republican precinct chairman, very proud of my Republican credentials. And this man knew that and still embraced me and uh, he, he said something to the fact that, hey, maybe one day you can be a judge or even on Texas Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And here I am. You know, what a blessing to have the privilege to be able to do that. And after um, Justice Gonzalez, we had my good friend, uh, a former Attorney General, Al Gonzalez. And he became the first Republican elected statewide. Oh. And he was elected to the uh, Texas Supreme Court, and shortly thereafter, Governor Bush became President Bush. And of course, President Bush took uh, Judge Gonzalez with him to the White House be to become the first Latino to be General Counsel to the to the President. And of course, the first Latino to be United States Attorney General. I was also a great mentor and a great friend of mine, and been a very positive influence on my life. And then we have uh, Xavier Rodriguez, who was appointed by then, uh, who was appointed by Governor Perry. Now, Xavier uh, drew a primary opponent, and Xavier unfortunately lost that race. But as fate would have it, would have it, uh, it worked out good for Xavier. Xavier was later appointed by President Bush to be a federal judge. Mm -hmm. now, judge Rodriguez sits on the uh, federal bench there in San Antonio, mm -hmm. and then after that. Um, when I was working for Governor Perry as his general counsel, one of my jobs was to interview and screen candidates for various positions, including the Texas Supreme Court. And it was during that process where he gave me the opportunity to become a, ju become a justice on the Supreme Court. So I'm the fourth, and I said, as I said earlier, I ran for election and uh, didn't have an opponent in the primary at that time, and I won. This time I've drawn two uh, opponents, and I look forward to that challenge. And as, uh, the motto was at the uh, Battle of Gonzales, you know, when the Mexicans went there to get the cannon, come and take it. You know. Yes, and then after you, we have the first Hispanic woman. That's right. This is really uh, fascinating because Justice Guzman, who was appointed by Governor Perry, she and I were classmates. We met in law school. We started law school together. We became good friends. Uh, she had very good notes, very smart, very intelligent, and did extremely well in school. But we became friends, and what's unique about that is not only you have two people from the same law school sitting on the Texas Supreme Court, you have two classmates. Wow. So that's, uh, that's an impressive statistic for our school, and um, we also have some other judges that actually came out of that class. Judge Vanessa Velasquez sits on a uh, criminal district bench in Harris County. Mm -hmm. She was appointed by Governor Perry. and. Uh, there are others as well. And then, of course, Justice Guzman won her race, and she had a contested primary. 
now Justice Guzman won her, won her race in a huge way. She is now, she won by the largest margin in the contested Republican primary than anyone. And as I understand that, before, the, before that judicial race, the largest margin of victory was by our good friend General Abbott. Yes. So he was the trendsetter and that has been broken by Justice Guzman. Now I'd like to win like that, but you know, I just have to get 50% plus one. But you probably can. I have the privilege to serve with, with Justice Guzman on that race. And and actually, I have the honor to meet you at her investiture. Remember. You remember, that's when we met. And certainly, Eva Guzman, we're very proud of her as well. Well, one of the questions that everybody... Excuse me. Let me add another, another sure. part of history. Uh, this past, I think, August, Governor Perry appointed the first Latina to the Court of Criminal Appeals. Now, that's our sister court. That's the Texas right. Supreme Court, we handle all civil matters. The Court of Criminal Appeals handles all criminal matters. He appointed Justice Elsa Acala to that bench. She becomes the yes, first Acala. Latina to, mm -hmm. to sit there in the history of, of Texas, the first Latina. Of course, the first Latino was uh, Justice Benavides, Benavides, who is now on the Fifth Circuit. So that's another historical landmark. That is so wonderful. I think one of the things that people like to hear sometimes is, what is your judicial philosophy? Because some people hear just about, well, uh, he's a judge, but what does he think? What does he stand for? So if you can share a little bit about your judicial philosophy so that people can know what Justice Medina. That, that's a great question, because that's a question that we actually ask people that are being interviewed for positions for a judicial appointment uh, of, any, of any sort, from the district bench all the way up to the Texas Supreme Court and Court of Criminal Appeals. My judicial philosophy is one of a conservative, and I have a very conservative judicial philosophy, and that simply means that I'm there to interpret the law, interpret the statutes as it's, as it's given to us by the legislature. I don't write the law. I'm not the author of the law. If the legislature gives us a statute, apply the strict meaning, give the words as simple as terms and apply that meaning. Don't try to create a meaning and shape a meaning the way I think it should turn out. Just to, I just want to interpret the statute. And sometimes the court doesn't necessarily agree with the statute, but it's the statute that's given to us. And if it has to be changed, the, the legislature can, be, can change it. Of course, unless there's a, a challenge to the constitutionality of a statute, and then we'll look at that as well, but I believe in stare decisis, which means that we take these cases, and if there's a history of the case being, or the law being a certain way, then we try to follow that law. And of course, unless it's an unconstitutional law, as, um, as most people are familiar with Brown versus the Board of Education, mm -hmm. you know, before that, the, the, the U.S. Constitution said that you can have separate but equal schools, separate but equal facilities. Well, the U.S. Supreme Court later declared that unconstitutional, and that's a good result. Um, but my judicial philosophy is one as a, of a conservative, a conservative Republican. One of the things that I like, uh, you are a conservative Republican. Sometimes people ask me as I am traveling the state and also the country about voices action and my conservative fiscal and moral values. But I think a lot of the values that you have have to do with your background. Uh, the fact that you are a Hispanic and that you have a Hispanic background maybe have a lot to do how your parents raised you. I would like if, uh, to know you can share a little bit about your Hispanic background, your family, and how do you shape those conservative values that you have as a Hispanic man? Well, that's, I like that question. Um, you know, not too long ago, probably the last you know, 15, 18 years, my father, who's very conservative, asked me why I was a Republican conservative. And we're sitting down having this discussion. I said, well, Dad, it's because you raised me. You raised me to be the man that I am and my sisters to be the women that they are, and of course my mother. And we were raised in a very conservative home. Uh, my mother is Catholic and I'm Catholic. Um, we went to Catholic church for a while and then we later went to Presbyterian church. But the basis was always a strong Christian foundation in our home. We went to church uh, you know, every Sunday and that, that was a very good event that we look forward to. Uh, Call every Saturday night. Uh, I had to uh, shine my shoes and my father's shoes so we get ready for church. And part of that process, uh, he taught me how to speak, my dad did, by encouraging us to memorize Bible scripture. So from a very young age, we were in front of the congregation uh, citing.
biblical passage, whether it's Psalm 23, whether it's the Beatitudes, um, we memorized those, the books of the Bible. We would do that in front of the congregation, and it was fun. And I think my dad probably at one time wanted me to go in uh, the area of being a preacher, but you know, I did the next best thing and I became a lawyer. <laughs> so that, uh, that was fun, but my parents, uh, we have strong roots to uh, Texas. Both my mother and father are, are from Galveston, Texas. I was born on the island, as we say, in Galveston, Texas. My grandmother was born on the island of Galveston, Texas. Uh, she was um, one year old when the 1915 hurricane uh, was there, and uh, thank God she survived that. And then um, that's on both sides of my family. And then, of course, you know, you try set on back, then there's uh, um, family was here when. Texas was part of Mexico. So we have been, uh, as I say, Texas born and Texas proud, but we're very, very, very proud of our of our heritage, of our Mexican heritage, and we're certainly proud of our Texas heritage. We've been blessed with four kids. I four have kids. Uh, two boys and two girls. You know, we're going through a birthday cycle right now, beginning on January the 2nd. So we'll have a birthday's January 2nd, uh, February the 13th, March the 15th, and March the 26th. And, um, my three oldest children are, are going to college, and then my youngest son is still in high school. And uh, we've, I tell you, having children is a blessing. I think we're sharing this story about um, my youngest son, uh, uh, Vincent. And uh, it's interesting that uh, when he was born, uh, we, had, we went through a situation where he, uh, the doctors told us that he probably wasn't he was going to be born with some uh, you know, birth defects. And so we went through that, that ordeal, and, uh, and the doctor we had at the time suggested you know, we do something that we just would not, uh, were not for, so we switched to doctors. And, and then, um, you know, we prayed about the situation, and, you know, whatever was going to happen, we were going to be prepared for it. And, um, and thank God, you know, he came out, he said, He's a healthy young young little boy, and um, you know, with no no birth defects, and that, you know, that's that in itself is a miracle, is a miracle to us. Yes. And you know, we've experienced a lot of them, probably uh, far more than we deserve. One of the things that people don't know about you, but I have learned uh, uh, to read about you, is that you like sports, especially the martial arts, right? I do. Can you tell me? Um, what exactly uh, martial are the martial arts that you practice, and, and how far have you gone? Well, I've uh, I've gone a pretty good distance, but not far enough. I have a black belt in Taekwondo, mm -hmm. and also have a black belt in Kaju Kimbu, which is, wow. as we say, the original mixed martial arts, which is a combination of karate, jujitsu, kimpu, Chinese boxing, wow. and uh, grappling. It's all that put together. It's a self-defense uh, technique. And um, I trained under Grandmaster Dan Baker, who's a 14-time world champion. Okay. I'm also uh, now learning the Filipino martial arts from a friend of mine called Erwin Ir Berlarda, who was actually the personal bodyguard of Lance Armstrong, and he was a protector of Governors Richards, Governor Perry, and Governor Bush. Wow. And uh, he's a very great martial artist, and he's, uh, he's, he's teaching me that. That's very interesting, Justice Medina. I would like to, to end this interview by asking you if, if you could give an advice to the younger generation, the kids who are in elementary, middle school, high school right now, college, what would you tell them in um, regarding school education and coming even to become a justice at the Supreme Court? What could you tell the younger generations about what they need to do so someday they can see themselves in a position like the one that you have or other positions of influence as leaders here in Texas and in the country? Well, I'll say it the way I think Joe would have said it, and that's, you know, stay involved. Obviously, become educated. And Joe was very, for, very much for that. He reached out beyond the guys in their 20s and women in their 20s. He went to the schools. He went to the high schools, encouraging kids to get involved in politics, to become educated. Helping some of those kids get appointments to the to the uh, Air Force Academy, Navy Academy, West Point. He helped many children do that. So the key to all this is education. The better educated you are, the better chance we have to succeed. And as Joe said, we just want to sit at the table. We want to be heard. 
we want we want to be listened to. Our opinion counts, and it counts more so than ever, because we are here. We've been here. We've become more political active. The young young uh, Latinos that are, are behind us, they're better educated than certainly my mother and father were, um, and certainly you know as educated and more educated than I than I am than we are. I mean, you have a son going to Stanford University. That is awesome. To have a Latino there at one of the best schools in the country, Justice Guzman's daughters at Harvard University. Those are those are the minds and, and the ideas that we want to be. We want to be part of our community and to help make our community better. And that's and that's as Joe said, you, you never stop giving. Okay, once you reach that goal, let's set another goal. Bring someone else up. Joe is always for bringing other people up, helping other people, promoting everybody. It was never about Joe Pena. It was about the good of our community, the good of the organization, the good of, of, of us. And that's who Joe Pena is, and that's his legacy. That's right. Uh, Justice Medina, for information for the people, if they want to find out more about you, can you give me your website, please? Well, we're working on a website. We hope okay. to have it up soon. But uh, and we'll I've, got post a, it. I've got a Facebook page. Okay. It's uh, Justice David M. Medina. You can go there and uh, friend me. Follow the campaign. It's going very well. We're picking up endorsements um, all over the state. Um, I'm proud to say I've been endorsed by former members of the Texas Supreme Court, including Chief Justice Phillips, uh, Attorney General Justice Gonzalez, my friend Raul Gonzalez, Craig Enoch, uh, Justice Hankinson, Justice O'Neill. They've all got uh, Justice Scott Brister. They've all endorsed my campaign. Uh, we just picked up the campaign the endorsement of uh, Hispanic Republicans of Texas, mm -hmm. and I'm honored to have that. Thank so we'll work hard across the state. Um, it's a challenge to, to try to win a re-election, but I'll, there are 254 counties in Texas. I can't get to all of them, but I want to get to most of them. Now we will be very supportive, but we want to say in behalf of both the section and in behalf of Texas GOP vote for your service and for this interview, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a ustedes. Gracias. Feliz Nuevo Año. Feliz Año Nuevo.